of times and even in my clinical practice also i have seen ki how much the labrum sometimes is you know misdiagnosed and we tend not to look into it and there are a lot of things we keep on th thinking when you have a pain around the hip you keep on thinking that probably it is just uh, maybe radiating from the lumbar and everything so uh, yeah. let's get on the basic topics that we uh, we would be covering is introduction, anatomy, the functions of the labrum, the causes of labral tear, clinical presentations, examination, imaging studies, interventions, complications, and the references. And references have given the whole list, so they are available at the internet. You can just, you know, uh, search for it. Okay, can I request everybody please to mute uh, their audios, please? Okay, so we get a proper flow. Okay. So shall we start? The first one is like uh, the first area that we'll be covering is the introduction of the labrum. Okay, the labral tears. So according to the CPG APTA, Clinical Practice Guidelines given by APTA in 2014, basically what APTA did was he gave, uh, uh, they gave, uh, like divided the hip pain into two basic, uh, uh, what are your classifications as the arthritic pain and the non-arthritic pain. We will be covering the non-arthritic pain. Maybe in future we will be taking up the arthritis sometime. Okay. So clinical, according to the CPG APTA 2014, okay, they defined hip joint pain or the non-arthritic pain as a collective uh, collection of hip pain conditions that is proposed to involve the intra-articular structures of the hip and includes the FAI. FAI is your femoroacetabular impingement. In future, in all the slides, I would be writing FAI. So please note down FAI is femoroacetabular impingement, just in case you guys uh, get confused. All those who know, it's okay. Then... Non-arthritic hip conditions also include your labral tears, your chondral lesions, your ligamentum teres tears, etc. So why has suddenly labrum become very interesting than before is because the with the advancement of technology, the new techniques, in previously last 10 to what do you say 10 years, we didn't have all these things, but it has started improving. Now we have the new techniques. That is why labrum tails are easily diagnosed this now. That is why also the incidence and prevalence also is right now more than before. Okay. Now coming to the next slide, the various non-arthritic hip conditions seen are FAI, the structural instability, osteochondral lesions loose bodies, ligamentum teres injury, and the labral tears. We are focusing on the labral tears. All these things maybe in future someday we take it, but today's our topic is the labral tears. These, these uh, classification or these are the listings that was given by the CPG 2014 APTA. Okay. Ultimately, you know, all these conditions basically in future, in chronic, when they become very chronic, they ultimately lead to labral tears. Because if you're having an FA for a very long time, FA happens to be one of the important causes of the labral tears. In the long run, they will lead to labral tears. So we will be speaking, discussing about all these things in the later slides. Okay. The anatomy. Labrum. It's a very strong flexible ring of fibrocartilage so basically if you if you just see the slide over here the picture that i have put this is your labrum it is like a horseshoe shaped okay it is it is uh, like uh, hardly the thickness is also not that much but it does not make a full circle it is like a horseshoe okay and here there's a gap this gap is basically basically filled by the transverse acetabular ligament over here. Okay, if if you have, I, I took a lecture around two to three months back about hip again that time also, and that then I had spoken that why why this gap is important. This gap is important because this when it is filled by this ligament transverse acetabular ligament, it creates a sort of a tunnel down over here for very. Uh, 
uh, sensitive structures like nerves and uh, vascular bundles to pass through it and supply the hip and the acetabulum. Okay, so it basically encircles the most of the outer ring of the acetabulum, 170 degrees, not 180 degrees of the femoral head. Okay. Still thinking there are a lot of people. Coming to the next slide, the thickness of the labrum is around 2 to 3 mm. It's wider and thinner on the anterior region and it is thicker on the posterior region. The, there's a significance about knowing this. This is the reason you have, have most of the labral trays in the anterior and the superior area. You do not have most of the labral trays uh, uh, in the posterior areas. One of the reason is because the anterior area is a little bit thinner as compared to the posterior part. The posterior labrum also has a sulcus. It is naturally present. That can be sometimes mistaken for a pathology. Okay. If you take a cross section of the labrum, for example, suppose this is the labrum. Just follow the arrow that I'm showing. This is the labrum. And you take a cross section from over here and you see it. Okay. It is, it is like a triangular structure. Okay. So it is like the base is towards the outside and the apex is towards the inside. Okay. The internal part is attached to the bone that blends with the articular cartilage also, uh, also known as the labrochondral cartilage. Okay. Now, this is a very interesting thing that I got, so I thought I will share it with you. Anterior and superior parts are thought to be the most innervated, having free nerve endings and sensory nerve endings that are responsible to produce pain, pressure, deep sensations. Okay, why are you supposed to know this? What is the clinical significance? Anybody? The basic clinical significance, I'll just tell you, the basic clinical significance over here is that this is because you have most of the uh, tears and everything also in the anterior and the superior parts. Okay, if you see this whole uh, figure out here, I have given a green part and I have given a red part. The green part basically uh, suggests the mechanoreceptors present and there are various shades of color, which shows the darkest shade is where you have the highest mechanoreceptors. As you can see, this is the anterior and slightly superior part. Coming down again to the red part, it is the noxiceptors producing pain. Again, if you see the darkest one has the maximum thing. And if you see all of these receptors are basically concentrated on the outer side. You have the very least on the inner side. It's mostly in the outer rim. Okay. We cannot even say one third. It's less than one third. Okay. Coming to the next slide. The labrum is basically... Uh, uh, formed of type 1 collagen fibers. This is the predominant collagen fibers that the labrum is formed of. And it is arranged in parallel to the acetabular membrane. Okay. Guys, can you please move, mute yourself? Guys, please mute yourself and maintain the sanctity of this lecture. Oh. Yeah. Okay, uh, you, uh, Dr. So Kuhn, you can mute, mute everyone except yourself. You can, mute you can mute everyone. You're the host, so you can mute everyone. Okay, mute. Hey, Jinnu Sharan, I'm going to mute. Can you help me out? Okay. Everybody. If you click on the on the icon, you can you can mute everybody. Guys, please mute yourself. I can't find it, but just a second. I'll, I'll just. Guys, please mute yourself. I mean, this is. Now everybody is muted. Yeah. Mute all. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Done. 
coming back to the same uh, where we had stopped, basically the labrum is formed of, as I was speaking, type 1 collagen fibers are predominant. They are arranged parallel to the acetabular rib. The main function of these collagen fibers are basically to resist cell forces. Okay. Vascular supply. Vascular supply, again, like the neural supply, is basically concentrated at the outer one third. If you follow here, if you follow the cursor that I'm talking about, it is basically over the outer third. The basic arteries, most important arteries that are supplying over uh, the labrum are obturator, superior, and inferior gluteal arteries. If you see this, this is the superior gluteal artery. They like form a network over here. And if you follow this, this is the inferior gluteal artery. Then again, follows a network over here. One interesting thing that you should see over here, okay, it supplies all the areas and less over at the end. Part. Again, one more reason why anterior labral tears are so common and if they occur, the healing is, a, is very, very difficult. The majority of the area again is avascular. Okay. Functions of the labrum. The functions, basic functions of the labrum are, first of all, starting from here, it basically the main important thing, it creates an negative intra-articular pressure. When there is a negative intra-articular pressure created, it will act as a seal. It won't, it will give you a little more of stability. Okay. It won't uh, allow the joint segments to move. Okay. Plus, if you have something, if you have already have a socket and you put something in the rim, again, it will deepen the acetabular force. And this is also one of the most important function of the labrum. Mechanical stability through gripping. It creates a gripping force like this. It dissipates the contact forces. Since when you have a labrum, you're increasing the volume, you're increasing the surface area. We have already read in physics in our school, when you have a larger surface area, your pressure dissipates, pressure is less. So that is also one more function. It also creates a fluid seal to prevent the synovial fluid leakage out to the periphery of the hip. Okay. Prevalence. Anterior part is mostly affected, as I have already discussed, uh, told in the previous slides also. Anterior part is mostly affected. These are the reasons because of its poor vascularity. One, it is mechanically weaker because it is thinner than the posterior area. Two, the incidence of the highest forces and stress is compared uh, to the other, the posterior areas is also more. Reason is because it's also given in the fourth point, as you can see, because the orientation of the femoral head is a little bit anterior, it's not towards the posterior. So as and when you do a weight bearing, whatever movements you're doing, the tendency of the forces coming on the anterior part is definitely more than the posterior part, okay? Another problem with this anterior orientation is you have less bony uh, constraint anteriorly. So the joint has to rely on the soft tissues or your passive structures or the labrum for the stability in the anterior part more than the posterior part. So it is another reason why again uh, you will be, you know, having uh, uh, anterior part affected more than the posterior. Okay. Coming to the next slide. Asymptomatic labral tears have been reported in the contralateral side of the patients undergoing surgery for FAI. This was a very interesting read, so I thought I'll just add it. So uh, this basically, you can just refer to the number of the uh, reference number in the last slide that I have given. Basically, what when they did this research, what they uh, found out was if uh, right side was affected for FAI and they did a surgery, they corrected it. Later on, they found that asymptomatic labral tears were present on the contralateral that was on the left side, and it was totally asymptomatic. And when they did a follow-up on these same patients, 9% of these people had a symptomatic labral tear in the next two years. So imagine the kind of follow-up they did, first of all. And secondly, ultimately, they it led to labral tears also in future. Okay. Now, the causes of the labral tear. You can basically divide the uh, causes into traumatic and atraumatic causes. The traumatic causes are usually seen in very young individuals, sports people who keep on falling, keep on hitting, keep on bashing each other. Okay, So the traumatic causes usually happen 
when you when when you have a fall or when you hit in a hyper abduction hip position or a hyper extension hyper flexion external rotation all these positions whenever then you have chances that there is a lateral tear the other eight traumatic causes most important fai femoral acetabular impingement that we'll be speaking about i'll just give you an idea in the later slides other causes are loose bodies or any structural instability and one more cause is the risk factors now the risk factors were a little bit long so i didn't put it here but i'll be telling in the future slides okay now this was a very interesting one article gender actually gave one more important factor one more important reason for a labral tear apart from structural instability structural issues what he told was there was a predictable pattern of a muscle imbalance that can also uh, cause structural issues inside can cause labral tears he called it as a lower cross syndrome i'm sure you guys would have heard it so which has uh, the features that is given over here so when you have a tightness of hip flexors and erector spinae and you have inhibited glutes and abs these two together will cause an anterior pelvic tilt and hyperlordosis of the lumbar spine what they will do in future is they will increase weight bearing on the anterior labrum we already know anterior labrum is predisposed more now again you have a biomechanical issues all these things taken together will cause can cause or predispose a person to a labral tear okay now it can also be the other way around this was one uh, article that i uh, read mumblyu uh, uh, don't uh, mind my pronunciation it is horrible i i even i don't know how to pronounce this mumblyu okay so you can uh, have issues uh, because of intraarticular problems like for example if you are having a labral issue it can also conversely affect or inhibit the muscles the working of the muscles what we call is arthrogenic muscle inhibition the major muscles in this article that was affected were the gluteus gluteus medius external rotators deep fibers of the gluteus maximus this was one uh, picture that was given in the article so i thought i'll put it over here it will help you okay the arthrogenic muscle inhibition will cause impaired neuromuscular control it will give you muscle atrophy it will compromise the tissue healing etc okay now coming to the causes what is the most important cause that we talked about it was the fai the most common cause femoral acetabular impingement now you can have basically three basic types of fai one is the cam one is the pincer and one is the mixed in short just for you to remember when you have an issue in the femoral head that causes the fai it is a cam type when you have a problem in the acetabulum it is the pincer type okay so you can remember pa pincer acetabulum okay then if you have a problem in the acetabulum when you have both you can have both it is possible then it is a mixed type where you have a cam uh, and a pincer type taken together okay now coming to the next one uh, i try to uh, get a little bit good pictures of the x rays so because you won't be you will be dealing more with the x rays in your clinical practice i don't know how many clinical practitioners are here but you will be dealing more with the clinical uh, this thing so when a person comes to you with a x ray in order to understand abnormal it is important that you understand normal first so this is a normal hip, hip x ray do you see the distance is around a few millimeters over here and uh, uh, femoral head is around uh, you know inside the acetabulum around 1/3 this is what is normal so what is that normal this is that normal this is cam type okay so when there is a cam type you will have a problem in the femoral head you will have a protuberance over here or an overgrowth something like that you see the black hair over there this is a cam type so when you have a cam type or you have a mm, uh, this thing when you have a overgrowth whenever the femur will move it will keep on hitting the labrum more than normal okay it's not like in normal cases whenever you are uh, doing the movements the labrum is not taking any pressure but here the pressure will be more than the normal so obviously the injury will be faster okay coming to the next one is the pincer the last slide i show you do you see the amount of femoral head that is covered by the acetabulum over here now check out this 
it is like most of the uh, uh, head is covered by the acetabular mover here. We call it as the acetabular over coverage. When you have this, whatever reason may be, this is called a pincer type. Okay. Now, when you have both, is the mixed type. You have a cam here. You have a pincer here. Okay. So what are the basic symptoms you see in an FAI? You will, uh, you know, you, hip pain usually will give you that C uh, sign kind of a pain. Usually when in FAI and in labral days, patient will complain you of anterior spine, anterior hip pain, okay? And in chronic stages, they will tell you I'm having a generalized hip pain over here. It may be aggravated by sitting and uh, when, when, when you have large tears, the patient may complain that I'm having a popping sound, I'm having a locking or a snapping sounds also. Okay. Now, what are the tests you can do? Okay, the the most important and or or in as such CPG APTA, if you read it for 2014, they do not give you one or two tests. They will always tell you because none of the tests have a good specificity and sensitivity. When you have like this, you always do a cluster of tests. You do more than two to three tests to go. And also, it is also a little bit of clinical reasoning. But you have to take all these things into consideration. But Fadir is known to give you a little bit of, you know, moderate kind of uh, uh, specificity and sensitivity. So you can look into it. You can do this first. But then again, it is important that do, you do it very slowly. As you can see, you take the hips slowly into flexion, slightly into adduction, and go for an internal rotation. Hence the initials F A D I R Fadir flexion, adduction, internal rotation. In case the patient is too much symptomatic or you are not sure, because sometimes when you do fast movements, you are too busy in the clinic and you want to check the patient only, you can do fast movements, you can end up making a small tear large. So be slow and gentle with this test. If you are in doubt, do it in initial range. So you are always on the safe side. Okay, because after the test, the patient shouldn't be telling you now my pain is increased. Okay, the, usually in FAI, again coming to the next point, internal rotation is less than 20 degrees with hip at 90 degrees of flexion. Abduction and flexion are also limited in these cases. Radiographic findings. Again, why I uh, added radiography is because you will be getting radiography. These are easy ones you can see and find out. In CAM types, there are different radiological findings in the CAM and the pincer type. Okay. So in the CAM type, you usually see an increased femoral head diameter. This is the femoral head diameter and this is the neck diameter. When you have more than normal, then you can suspect a CAM type. Now, if you are suspecting this, if you are suspecting an FAI or a CAM type or this thing, you cannot simply give an AP lateral view of the X-ray. You have to talk, you have to give an X-ray order stating a done view in which you need to search an alpha angle of more than 60 degrees. Okay, now what is an alpha angle? Alpha angle is like, you gave a done view like this. Okay, you can give it at 45 degrees and you give it at 90 degrees also. So after you get an X-ray, you basically get, draw a line from the center of the femoral head extending to the neck and another line that connects the protuberance or wherever you see that there is a mm -hmm. abnormality in the femoral head. So this angle, when it is more than 60 degrees over here, then you start suspecting a cam type. Okay, then further things are needed. Then another thing, another view that you can order is a frog leg view. This is something that they do. Okay, I don't know everywhere they do or not. There you can check your head and neck offset, which is less than 0 0.14 in the uh, uh, cam type. Basically, head and neck offset is basically you're checking the uh, how much is your, you know, uh, attachment or how much is the stability or how much is, uh, are they together, the articulating surfaces. Now, coming to the next one is the pincer type. So what, what are the things you should be searching in the x-ray or in the radiographic findings when you're suspecting a pincer type? So the first one you can be checking is the acetabular depth. How do you know the acetabular depth is normal or not? You basically draw a line from the ileum to the istrium like this. And your acetabulum is medial to it. 
inside of it, then your depth is more. Depth. Ideally speaking, it should be lateral to it. But if it is medial to it, then you have increased acetabular depth, otherwise known as technical term coxa profunda. Okay. The other thing that you should you can check is the lateral central edge angle. These are very easy terms. I know when you're hearing this, I don't know how many of you have heard of it before. Uh, you must be thinking this is too much to handle. But then again, this is the whole point that you should be knowing more and more. As much more you know, more your clinical practice will improve. Okay, that is why we have included all these things. When you start practicing, when you start noticing all these things in your x-rays, you will definitely know, okay, I'm better than what I said before. Fine. Coming to the central edge, you draw a straight vertical line from the center of the femoral head. Okay, like this. And another line that is connected to the superior astribular rib. This angle should be more than 35 degrees if you are suspecting a pincer. Pincer type. Okay, that means it is saying that your if this this much should be your acetabular, now it is this much. Okay, we do not want that. Acetabular protrusia, this is somewhat same as the coxa profunda. Acetabular protrusia is when, uh, if this is the ileoischial line that we have talked about, I, I'll show you in the pic. Okay, in coxa profunda, only the acetabulum will be medial to it. But in acetabular pro protrusia, your femoral head will also go medial. Okay, so now you have two problems here. Okay, now this is acetabular protrusion. See this? Okay, this is a very unstable problem. Now you, you just imagine like the whole femoral head over here you can see is inside. If you remember that I showed you the normal hip, only one third was inside almost. This is like everything is inside now. The crossover sign, crossover sign is a little bit difficult. I think if, if you're asking a radiologist also they'll tell you, but just for your knowledge, you should be knowing. It is used to assess the acetabular antiversion. It occurs when the anterior acetabular wall is the yellow line here, is anterior to the posterior acetabular wall in the superior portion. Okay, then you start suspecting an anterior uh, acetabular inversion, antiversion. Okay. Then again, you can also search for a modified tonus angle. It should, it when it is less than zero degrees. I'm not going in very details. Uh, we have spoke about this in detail in a lower quarter. This sir had already talked about tonus angle in detail, how to measure it and everything. So I'm not going in detail. I mean, people who have entered uh, and attended it, you should be knowing. And this is a little bit uh, complicated also. Okay, the second most important cause is the structural instability. Structural instability, you will be having issues inside structural, that there should be some structural alterations in the hip that can lead you to anterior groin pain. Symptoms almost will be the same. You can have an anterior groin pain or a generalized hip pain. Padir and Faber will be painful. Hip apprehension is positive. Internal rotation here will not be as affected as had, uh, we had read it in FBI. In FBI, we saw it as like, Markedly reduced to less than even 20 degrees, but the internal rotation is less affected. Or it is like, uh, this thing. Okay. Now, if you are looking for structural instability in uh, the radiography, you can search for acetabular inclination that we talked about, tonus angle. Tonus angle here will be more than 10 degrees. When you're suspecting an FBI, tonus angle will be less than zero degrees. Remember that. So if you know how to measure a tonus angle, if you have attended the lower quarter, you will you can make a difference. Okay. Again, the lateral central edge angle is less than 25, 25 degrees. We already spoke about it. What are the risk factors? These are these are the factors you know that you have very less. Uh, work you can because these are something that is already uh, problematic inside you can hardly treat it or hardly do this you can do less about it the factors are the labral width will be less than 6 mm you will have a higher alpha angles we talked about alpha angles previously slip capital femoral epiphysis congenital hip dysplasia capsular uh, laxity 
okay capsular laxity is uh, seen in a condition known as uh, ehlers danlos syndrome it, you have a general laxity you have hypermobility basically in all the joints in these cases what happens is like the joint surfaces are moving more than normal so obviously the stress putting will be more than normal okay coming to the next slide clinical presentations of the labral tears the most familiar complaint a labral tear patient will tell you is an anterior hip or the groin pain, which may sometimes also radiate to the knee. Okay, so this is where you have to be thinking because I have seen one labral tear. I remember the patient was actually complaining of you know um, the pain above the superior to the patella. It was like uh, you could hardly you know he wasn't telling more over here. He was telling over the thighs and things. It led you to think that probably there's a quadriceps insufficiency or something. Okay, so just just keep your eyes open for all these things. In general, the pain basically will develop gradually. Uh, since these are aneural structures, labrum is an aneural, initial stages or initial damage is usually not painful, it is asymptomatic and we, that is why usually these labral tests do not come forward very easily, okay? Patient may complain you of night pain, weight bearing uh, activities like climbing stairs and uh, they will tell you that they are having a constant dull pain, maybe present in, uh, you know, like walking, pivoting, long sitting, running, representing a sharp pain. Pivoting is like when you are, um, okay, if you can see me, yeah, pivoting is like you are putting weight on one leg and you are pivoting like this. Okay, so basically when you're turning too much on one side, uh, putting pressure or putting weight on the affected side, this is what we call as pivoting. So this is this is something that you, that you can ask in the history. That, uh, does your job or does anything, uh, uh, your activities daily routine involves more of pivoting or anything in there? If that you are having pain, okay, so you can relate it to the labral test. The less mechanical symptoms is like clicking, locking, catching. You usually see when you have larger tears because then they are, then there is like gross instability. So uh, in those cases, you will have catching, you will have locking, something like you see meniscal tears, knee meniscal tears, okay. Now, coming to the next one, this was also a very interesting research that I got. It was quite recent, you know. So, even though your labrum is a vascular and it is a neural, you do not have that kind of labrum. How come you're having that kind of pain there? Okay, why it is, uh, there was an article published by Koya Maiton. Okay, what they did was they found out that there are elevated levels of TNF alpha, IL1 beta, cyclooxygenase. What they do is they keep on irritating the synovial lining of the hip. That is why they, you keep on getting that pain, okay? So it is it is not basically coming directly from the labrum, okay? But it is like the synovial lining, it will be keep on irritating, okay? Although some of the pain will be from the labrum because we have some of the uh, vascular, uh, the thing and the uh, neural supply, we have vascular supply, definitely. Neural supply is there, pain will be there slightly, but this is also one of the factors, okay? Isolated tears are usually seen in younger patients. Coming to the examination part. Now a patient comes to you, you know, he'll tell you, I'm having an anterior groin pain, I'm having a pain over here, I have a generalized pain. How do you diagnose? How do you test? Okay. Now, according to CPG APTA 2014, as I was speaking previously also, you usually do not focus on one test, although the Padir is giving you a little bit of sensitivity and everything, but still, when you have one test that has does not have a mind-blowing specificity and sensitivity, this is where you go at least three to four tests. Okay, do those tests use a little bit of clinical reasoning also for taking the history, subjective examination, objective examination, and then you come to a this thing asking asking the patient to go for X-rays and everything. Now you know we have already spoken about uh, what kind of X-ray positions you should be ordering. Just do not write an AP lateral. Write a done view. If you're suspecting an FAI, FAI in chronic surgery, patient tells you that I'm, I'm having pain six, seven years. Maybe now it is a uh, FAI for six, seven years care will obviously affect your labrum by now. So these are the things that you should be doing, keeping in mind. 
The other less specific tests are the Patrick or the Faber test, flexion, abduction, external rotation, straight leg raise tests, because flexion is sometimes painful and it is also limited as we talked about. Log roll test, apprehension test, these are the tests you should be doing, okay? Imaging studies. Uh, MRA, again, according to CPG APTA, has is considered the gold standard. Arthroscopy I, has, I have included, uh, but it is not actually, actually included in the imaging studies, but definitely arthroscopy is the gold standard. But when you're talking about the imaging studies out here, MRA, uh, magnetic resonance arthrogram, is the gold standard. It is a, it has a sensitivity of 71 to 100% and specificity of 44 to 71%. Keep this in mind, okay? Sometimes MRI will miss the labral tears. Interventions, what you can do? Now you have done everything. You know you have a labral tear, okay? Suppose uh, sometimes we'll get small labral tears. Sometimes we'll get large shape, uh, labral tears. Sometimes uh, even though the labral tears are small, patients are too much of symptomatic. They have a lot of pain. You need to take a decision. You're supposed to send them for surgery or you do you want to do it all by yourself, okay? So again, coming back to the most mind-blowing research, CPG APTA, they have done a 2014 research over here, okay? This again will be uh, reviewed in 2024. So probably we will be again doing uh, a talk or a lecture about this uh, labor now that we have the recent research. What they told was, they gave a list of the interventions as put over here, patient education, manual therapy, stretching, strengthening exercises, therapeutic exercises, neuromuscular education I've listed over here. But all of them are having a level five evidence. Okay, too bad. But but if you are, they also have stated, if you read this article very thoroughly, they've also stated that when all these things are doing done together, like a multimodal approach, then they have a level B or a level C evidence, much better than a level F evidence. So you try to do everything. All of that is listed. I, I, we will give you a little bit of glimpses of how to handle it because taking the time constraints, we cannot give you everything, but we'll definitely cover it in our modules or lower quarter because sir is, last time that was when sir is beautifully explained of how to do and uh, shown also. Okay, so for further this thing, you should actually attend modules. So the first thing that you should explain to the patient is patient education. What not to do? What are the positions to avoid? Try not to sit in the low height chair. Why? Because then you have a higher flexion. Okay, we do not want that. So either use a chair or you can keep pillows over the chair and then sit Then your hips are not. It shouldn't go beyond 90 degrees. Okay. Try using assistive devices. Why assistive devices? Because it will put less pressure. You can use it on the contralateral side. So it will use, it will take off that weight from the hip. Avoid symptom prov provoking activities. What are the symptom provoking activities? Flexion, adduction, internal rotation. So if a patient, you ask them, do you have a habit of sitting cross leg on a chair or anything? If you're doing it, avoid it. We do not want that. Okay, this is the patient education or two to three points that we would be giving. You should be explaining. Manual therapy, you can give definitely manual therapy, but in grade one and grade two oscillations, you do not give uh, thrust, you, you do not give very heavy procedures or heavy exercises also. Remember when labrum also works in a little bit of stability like we discussed in the functions, okay? So now when it is compromised, okay, your stability is also compromised to some extent. So you cannot give heavy exercises also, you, can give, you cannot give heavy manual therapy also, you can end up damaging it more. So do no harm is the main rule, okay? So manual therapy, avoid positions of flexion and internal rotation. Even if you are trying it, like I will show you some positions in the later slides, how you can do it slowly and steadily, but everything is also dependent upon the patient's symptoms, okay? Stretching. Stretching, if you feel some of the muscles are, uh, what do you say, tight or anything, if you feel, in those cases, you can give, uh, stretching, okay, but the ankle should be 
feeling soft. Everybody knows what enfield is. It's like when you are checking a range of motion at the end range, how are you feeling? You're feeling a hard end feel. You're feeling a soft end feel. You're feeling a soft end feel. You can use stretching if a muscle is tight or a muscle is hypertonic maybe. Strengthening exercises. We took a slide. We took a slide about arthrogenic innovation. If you guys remember, okay. What What are the muscles that we talked about? Anybody? What are the muscles that we talked about? Do you remember? We talked about gluteus medius. We talked about gluteus maximus, and we also talked about yes, 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 yes. Good. You are listening. Uh, we also talked about. One more. We talked about gluteus medius. We talked about gluteus maximus, and we talked about the external rotators. Remember, we talked about the external rotators. So these are the things, the muscles that need will need strengthening because they have gone for arthrogenic inhibition because you are having an intra uh, articular injury over here. Understood? Coming to the therapeutic exercises also. Uh, if the range of motion, we can give simple range of motion exercises so that you will have a little bit of mobility in the joint. Okay, strengthening exercises anyways included. Neuromuscular re-education. What is neuromuscular re-education? Neuromuscular re-education is like you are teaching the patient uh, specific positions that are right and inhibiting special, specific positions that are wrong. For example, um, you get a patient, this is, and you know, remember ki, these are the things that you need to observe when a patient sometimes, you know, comes walking to you also. Like when we were doing a college days, we were taught ki, whenever you are doing an um, assessment, half of the thing when the patient comes walking to you inside, you should be knowing. Like how is he walking? Is the knees falling properly? And now you're checking the lower lip. So you should be seeing that is, is, is the hip going for a little bit of internal rotation while walking? or is the, is the gait, gait pattern not properly, all these things, if you're finding it, if you're finding it a little bit of functional bias or anything, then you are supposed to be correcting it. And slowly and steadily, you're supposed to be training the patient in different positions. This is neuromuscular re-education, okay? And this is the most difficult part because the patient will do strengthening. Neuromuscular education is like, it's not just the one hour that the patient is coming to you for the in the clinic. This is something that they have to keep in their mind throughout the day, even during that daily routine. Okay. As I was saying, multimodal approach gives you a level B and a level C evidence. Sweet, right? Okay. The CPG also states that there is no consensus of the superiority of the surgical management over the non-surgical management. So we do not know for sure till now with the best researchers also that if the surgical event supposed you decide you do not want to do a non-surgical, for example, you have a large labral tear and you want to send the person for, person for surgery, we still do not know it is going to be, you know, giving you a very good, uh, what do you say, outcome or how the prognosis will be because labral tears really heal very slow even if it is a surgical management. Okay, now this was one article that I got to so I thought I'll share it with you. Daniel Props Retort 2023. You can check in the research one. What they did was they did a systemic review with the meta-analysis over the rate of response to non-operative treatment for hip-related pain. They took 26 different studies. All in all, if you count, there were 1,153 patients. So they concluded that over half of the patients with non-arthritic hip-related pains reported satisfactory response to non-operative treatment, okay? But they couldn't uh, tell you what are the essential elements in the non-operative treatment that actually helped. So they also took a multi-model approach. They did everything. So they couldn't come to a conclusion about what actually worked. Okay, so ultimately CPG, what was uh, saying was fine that you are supposed to take a multi-model approach, okay? Now, uh, McDonald et al. again published an article suggesting that certain exercises and mobilizations uh, that are helpful in cartilage degeneration can be used in labral tears too, but with caution. So I have listed some of it because everything cannot be told over here. So I've listed some of the slides. If you can see over here, he talked about lateral glides and medial glides. I mean, he literally emphasized in his article of lateral and medial glides. And... Uh, not for the labrum because I see labrum very less, but I have seen FAIs. 
and lateral medial glides literally go for FAI. Uh, like literally treated. And I have done a follow-up on certain patients with FAI for like three months also and they have told that we are fine. So you can use this glides. Okay. Yeah, this is the position that you can take and you can give lateral glides like this. Remember, you are only supposed to give only grade 1 and grade 2 oscillations. Do not pull, push too much. Okay? Now, as a uh, uh, addition to this same lateral glide, if you feel that uh, the, the range of motion of internal rotation or external rotation or something is affected, you can slightly put the hip into internal rotation, okay, while you are giving the lateral glide. If you feel the range is increased and don't do too many repetitions once at a time. You got a little bit of range, fine. You can give simple range of motion exercises slowly, maybe passively, steadily, active assisted. Then you work out with two more work again. Don't try to get everything in one single day. This is a very slow process. Remember, labrum slow, heals very slowly. I've already told. So don't jump, don't push, don't pull. Okay. Uh, coming to the long axis distraction, okay, with the hips slightly in flexion, abduction, and slightly external rotation. You can only do it in a little bit of flexion. Why? Is because this is the open back position of the hip. Again, it is important. Um, we really emphasize an open back and closed back positions because when you give mobilizations in an open back position, it is better. When you give it is in closed back position, it is not going to give you any results. Rather, it can harm. Grade 1, grade 2 mobilizations only. Okay? Do not trust. Absolute contraindication in hip lateral, lateral tears. You will do more harm in that. Okay? Inferior glides. Okay? Slowly. Grade 1, grade 2. Slowly. You can add, keep on adding a little bit of abduction range with it. Okay? And again, it will be dependent on the patient's symptoms. If the patient is doing really okay, it's paining too much. Don't push. Okay. Medial glides can also be combined with the mild traction. Sorry, there's a spelling mistake. It's traction. So you can have another therapist give a mild traction. Repeating again, mild traction. And then you can give a small medial glide, grade 1 and grade 2. Okay. Coming to the stretching part, usually in hip labral tear, um, the most uh, affected, uh, short and I would say hypertonic actually, iosoas is usually a little bit of tight. You may feel the range a little bit reduced for extension and everything. So you can give a gentle stretching for this. If you feel that the stretching is not working, METs are also very effective mechanism, they have less chances of increasing your symptoms. Just last month only we did, I think, uh, uh, lecture or, or module, we finished our module for MET and this thing. So, where sir have totally explained how to do it for each and every muscle, okay? So, it, is, it was really informative if you can join me. Anyway. So, MED is when you feel he's stretching, okay, you're a little bit skeptical, you do not want to be stretching, you feel the patient is, has, is having too much of symptoms, you do not want to push or pull anything, then you can use MED. MED does help. I usually use MED more than stretching. I do, I'm not a very good fan, big fan of stretching. Okay, now, you can also do exercises. What are the therapeutic exercises that you can do? Hip abduction, supine hip abduction can be done, can be given in a uh, supine line. You can give it a little bit of assistance if you feel that the patient is not able to do himself because this is a good exercise for which muscle? Can anybody tell me in the chat box which muscle you are referring to? Hip abduction, what muscle? Anybody? Okay. Anybody? Hip abduction you are doing? Yes. Yes. Good. Gluteus medius. Okay. Um, you can give a close kinematic or uh, chain exercise also where you can, you know, keep a small slider over here. Small slider over here. If the patient will have uh, you know, easily they can do a hip abduction. Later on, you can ask them to do it. 
all by themselves. Okay, this is the hip abduction you can do. This is basically for gluteus medius, seeing the leg bridging. If the patient is not able, there's not, it's not a hard and fast road to start with uh, bridging altogether. If you feel the patient is not able to do single leg, go for the normal bridging and progress to single leg. Okay. Now, when do you do a surgical uh, repair? When you have done a conservative management, you know it's not working. Patient is telling you, okay, I'm not getting fine. That's when you refer. Okay, all these things are not working for a period of time. You have work, you have, you have really worked hard. Send the patient. It's nothing you can do. So the surgical repair, uh, uh, things that your surgical uh, interventions that you can do is either a repair or a reconstruction. Now, this is completely out of scope of this lecture. I'm not taking the whole thing. What is what you're doing repair and reconstruction? Okay, but it's not like you cannot know. You can always read. Okay. So uh, there are certain articles related to, you know, that a that, uh, uh, little bit support the surgical repair a little bit more. So that I have added. This was a recent article that I have highlighted it all. They did a retrospective analysis to compare the operative and non-operative laboral injuries in 47 college athletes. What they found that operative uh, treatment showed a lit little clinically higher percentage of success in high level competitions. Okay. But in terms of days lost, the operative management lost more days. Okay. So the non-operative group that was there, they were given all the multimodal approaches and they were still able to play. But when you have a surgery, you obviously have to go for a, what do you say, immobilization period, then you will have a slowly mobilization, then you have to give weight-bearing activities, then you have to give proprioception stage, all these things will come up. So obviously the days loss will be more. Okay. Ultimately, however, they concluded that there's still a debate that which one is a better option. Okay. And there are no very good researchers stating that, okay, you have to do this and this is the best way. Shaver and Lewis also published an article. This was actually done in 2006. It's not as recent, but since it was Sarman, and I'm a fan of Sarman, so I put it. Okay, so where they discuss the importance of correcting the biomechanical factors, very important. As I was speaking, when a patient enters your clinic, comes walking to you, and you see that probably the lordosis, is lumbar or lordosis is small, uh, probably the patient is not standing properly. Probably the patient is walking with a little bit of random, random, whatever. If you see all these things, you should be observing in the initial stages. You cannot ask these things to the patient. It is not even possible. They won't even understand. Okay, this is something you have to observe. And also the best way to observe it is when the patient is not knowing and the patient does not know that you're observing. Okay, then only you will be able to know that if they are doing it, the same thing at home or not. If they get conscious, they will try to do the correct things. Okay. So Simon and Lewis published an article in 2006 where they discussed the importance of correcting the biomechanical factors that is resulting in excess stress. So if you're seeing any biomechanical anomalies, your, the main goal there should also be correcting this. Because see, if these biomechanical issues or these functional problems are there, even if you send the patient to surgery, this is going to stay because this is where neuromuscular re-education comes into play. Okay, they will still be doing the same issues. They will still be doing the same problem because... There is a muscle imbalance that you need to correct. Okay. So these all things also should need to be addressed. If you find this and you feel, okay, the patient needs to go for a surgery, try to correct all these things first before referring them to the surgery. Because then the patients, you know, they'll come really good. Okay. So the general goal is to optimize the general alignment of the hip, control of the hip abductors, lateral rotators, the G-max, my favorite muscle, iliosoas and reducing dominance of the quads and the hands okay you need to assess the length crossing the of all the muscles crossing the hip joints length and strength okay they assess the positions and movements of the hip in various positions this is a very very important thing if i don't know how many have read the sermon book thoroughly for each and every hip uh, joint uh, the the uh, movement impairments that she has given she has assisted in each and every position, not just the standing or sitting, prone also, quadruped also, single leg stand also, because what she feels is you should be assessing all these areas. Okay. One thing may not be happening, one movement dysfunction may not be happening in single leg stands, but it may be happening in quadruped. So you shouldn't be missing all these things. Okay. What are the complications? This is something that is the main uh, 
you know, a USP or standpoint of this thing, okay? Uh, chondral damage is something that you see in older patients when you when your labral tear is quite advanced, okay? You, it predisposes the articular cartilage, okay? Then it will cause instability. You will have joint degeneration later on. And you can have a cephalous nerve entrapment. Okay, so cephalous nerve entrapment is not always safe. But if a patient is coming to you, I'm having a hip pain since two years. I have this work. I walk a lot. Climbing stairs is too much. Okay, and recently since two months, I have started feeling tingling and numbness in the dorsum of my foot. Tingling and numbness means it should strike you guys if it's a nerve entrapment. Somewhere it is happening. But you check the lumbar. All is clear. Okay? You this thing. So where is it coming from? Then you should be coming towards the hip also. When the instability is too much, when the labral tear has expanded, extended to a point, when the instability has increased too much, that's where the movement happens too much. And as I had told previously also, Anterior part movement is always more than the posterior part. And you have a cephalous nerve entrapment, cephalous nerve or the femoral nerve over there. Okay. So when the patient is telling you that I am having tingling and numbness over the dorsum of my foot, along with pain in the groin of my hip, and you did all the lumbar tests and it is negative, that's when you start searching for hip problems. Okay. That's when you do also a stiffness nerve entity. And if it is positive, and if you have a fadi and everything, uh, what do you say, uh, positive, then you should be sending the patient for radiological findings. Okay, this is when you know that the instability has set up and the chances of surgical management increases over here because uh, it all also depend upon, you know, the age of the patient, the work of the patient. Sometimes, you know, the patient is still working. They wouldn't want to lose too many days. You do not want to, you know, do hit and trial method. You want to, you would like to uh, send the patient for surgery and find out exactly how much is the damage. Okay. This is a saphenous nerve entity that we have done. Uh, the patient is lying in prone. We do a little bit of hip extension. The subject I used, she was not able to coordinate an extension. So we are actually supposed to give a hip extension also. Give a little bit of hip abduction, medial rotation, and then you do a dorsiflexion and eversion. Okay? You do a dorsiflexion and then you do an eversion. If the symptoms increase, if the symptoms, existing symptoms increase, okay? Patient is not, if the patient tells you I'm having a stretch pain or anything, no. When you're doing an NDT, you should be searching for exacerbation of symptoms. What the patient tingling numbness is increasing or not. Stretch pain is, patient is having tingling numbness, you're doing an NDT and they're just saying I'm having a stretch pain. You cannot tell it as a positive test straight away. Do more tests to be sure. Okay. Okay. Now we are done. With this thing, this is the reference that I have put forward. I put in at least 15 of them. All of them are available in the internet. I really want you to read everything because this will really increase your knowledge. Okay. Um, TJ, sir, you want to add anything? I think this was very detailed. We'll post this on YouTube if you want to go back and review the slides or if you want to go back and listen to, listen to anything. I think... Uh, I think uh, Dr. Pooja did a lecture on anterior glide medial rotation syndrome a few months ago, right? Yeah. And this is technically a kind of a continuation of that because a lot of hip intraarticular problems like FAI and labral tears can coexist with anterior glide medial rotation syndrome. So if you if you go back and look at both the lectures again, I think you'll it will improve your understanding, understanding non-arthritic, non-arthritic hip problems. We're going to stick around for five, 10 more minutes if you have any questions. Next weekend, we are doing a lecture on discogenic pain and myths regarding discogenic pain because I think sometimes it's overdiagnosed. And Dr. Amit will be taking that lecture. If you have any questions regarding this lecture, I think we'll stick around for 10, 15 more minutes. Anything you want us to discuss again? Anything you want us to...
Yes, we are we are doing a lecture next weekend on on the disc on discogenic pain if that's the only cause of back pain. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want Dr. Pooja to discuss anything again, guys? Please let us know. All the numbers you have shared, I think I will add you to the group. Any doubts, guys? I think these are a lot of details. Go back and relook at the presentation. And we will share it on YouTube. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram. What could I do for biomechanical corrections? Look at where what the weakness is. I think we, we spoke about intraarticular problems. We spoke about gluteus medius, gluteus maximus, external rotators. Work on that. Okay. Basically, what biomechanical correction is, when you have anything out of normal, for example, a patient comes to you walking, okay, you want to assess his gait, and you feel the patient is, for example, putting too much of hip adduction while they are walking, then the normal, one side is working fine, one side is not working, it is going for too much of adduction. In those cases, that is the biomechanical anomaly. Okay, this is not normal. This is a biomechanical issue. Now, when you're finding that hip adduction is too much. Why is this coming? Is this just an adductor problem? Or it is it is just that the patient is having a habit or it is the lateral uh, hip abductors that are weak? What is actually the problem? You need to search there and you need to correct there. So that is why I uh, included a point in the interventions. If you check for length and strength both. Okay, what is tight? What is weak? And you have to correct it that way. And then the last part is neuromuscular re-education. Okay. That, that will have to be there throughout the day. Not only, only in your clinic. You have to give patient education like that. Guys, I think so. How to differentiate between hip arthritic and non-arthritic? I think for hip arthritic, the tests are different. The clinical criteria is very different. For non-arthritic, which Dr. Pooja spoke about, we spoke about saphenous nerve involvement. We spoke about using cluster of tests. We spoke about, she spoke about using Faber, Fadir. Sometimes you can use log roll test. You can use Eber, Idir, cluster of test. And then the imaging, you can use MR arthrogram. Gold standard is arthroscopy. We're going to do a lecture on arthritic portions of the hip or arthritic. There's a clinical prediction guideline, I think published in 2017 which we're going to review at some point. Okay. What is the best treatment for? Guys, I mean, please keep your questions to this lecture. We, I can answer, I mean, you can ask all sorts of questions, but please keep these questions, keep your questions related to this, related to this presentation. Okay. Can chronic FL lead to developing coxa valga? Possibly, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there can be a possibility, but I mean, what do you have to say, uh, Dr. Pooja, about this? Actually, FAI leading to coxal gait, it is more, you know, the other way around, because this is coxa a structural valga? issue. Coxa valga. It's, she's talking about coxa valga, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So coxa valga. Between AVN and FAI. I think the best thing is the end field. What do you think, sir? Because yeah, yeah, pers yeah. personally, I have seen FAI won't have that kind of hard end field as AVN does. And yeah. uh, this also... Uh, as I do think I that FAI is a further progression of... I mean, FAI can open in a long run lead to AVN. Okay. So... I think imaging, I think X-ray is, is X-ray or CT would be the probably the best best differentiator if you want to see FAI. I mean, for AV and especially, you need like X-ray or probably CT. Maybe you should also ask the history because after COVID, we are getting to so many. Just ask if they had a history of COVID. Yeah. You know, because there has been so much of steroid uh, being given to the patients. You know, then you should be actually suspecting AV and if they have a history of steroids. 
I think gold standard for AVN, I think, is CT, if I'm not wrong. Gold standard AVN is CT. If you want to diagnose AVN, you definitely need a CT. Gluteus medial muscle stimulation effective. I mean, muscle stimulation is effective if you, I mean, you can try for strengthening. Yes, you can try it. I mean, I mean, the evidence on electrical stimulation is kind of dodgy, but you can use it if you initially, if you're not able to turn on the muscle. But the, from, if you took a look from the evidence standpoint, the evidence is very dodgy for electrical stimulation. We actually use stimulation for patients who cannot even generate a hip abduction in plane of gravity. Like in supine, I told that is the plane of gravity one. Okay, so if a patient is not able to do a hip abduction in supine, then what else you can do? You, you can give a functional stimulation, like you put the stimulation and then ask the patient to do with it. It actually helps in some cases. And then you again switch it to, uh, what do you say, weight-bearing exercises for Gucci, madam. 